and I'll just say, um, Sarah is a very kind person because she likes my baklava when I make it. <laughs> and um, Daryl Ray recommended that Sarah come talk to the group, and uh, uh, she he he was uh, he. Uh, really thought that she had a message that we needed to hear and she is the president of the Kansas City Atheist Coalition. So as Barbara said, uh, my name is Sarah Hargreaves. Um, I'm actually not the current president of the Kansas City Atheist Coalition, but I, I was a founding member um, with six others. Um, so myself and six others uh, founded the Kansas City Atheist Coalition back in 2011. It's a 501 to nonprofit organization focused on activism, philanthropy, and um, community. Um, so, a little bit of background about that organization. Um, in addition to that, I, I am currently working with um, Camp Quest in Kansas City. We just had our first summer this year, so that was very exciting. And then, um, before any of that, even I, I started, I was organi I'm the organizer of a group called um, the Kansas City Skeptical Women's Meetup Group. So, that's a little bit about what I do in the Kansas City area. Um, and I've been attending meetup groups in Kansas City that focus on free thought and skepticism for, for years. Um, the Skepticon 3 was my first major kind of event that got me really excited about the movement and wanted me to do more for the movement. Um, so in 2011, um, the Kansas City Atheist Coalition, one of the first events we actually participated in as an organization was this event called Slut Walk KC. Um, and for people who don't have a background uh, for what Slut Walk is, um, it, its mission essentially is to combat uh, pervasive victim blaming and slut shaming attitudes and beliefs in our society. Um, these rallies began after a Toronto police officer said to a woman who was recording a sexual assault, um, women who do not want to be raped should avoid dressing like sluts. Um, which is obviously a super cruel and heartless thing to say to anybody, but when it comes from the person that you're recording your assault to, it's, it's particularly damaging. Um, sadly, stories like these actually are not rare. They're not rare at all. Um, and um, and that, how I know this, another little bit of background about me is um, I have been co-facilitating a women's sexual assault support group for six years at that time, um, between 2005 and 2011, um, with an organization called uh, MOXA, a Metropolitan Organization to Counter Sexual Assault. So um, my speech focuses on that. Um, well, it, it draws from that experience um, to illustrate some of the points I'll be making. So KCAC participated in this event just as an organization. The organization asked for us to, uh, to, to give a brief talk if we would like, if we liked. M my background and, you know, I was just like, yeah, certainly, I, I think I have something to say about this. Um, so uh, this, the speech I'm about to give you folks is what I gave initially at Slut Walk. Um, and I thought uh, it might be useful because my talk is actually pretty brief anyways, it's about 10 minutes. Um, I thought it might be useful to show this video that um, the Slut Walk organizers put on. Um, it's, it's brief, it's fine. <laughs> Women who uphold the virtues of the Madonna 
the mother of Jesus, women who are pure, virginal, and submissive to male authority, deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. While women who act in a way not in accordance with these edicts, women who dress or act seductively, who drink or dance or flirt with men, or, heaven forbid, actually have sex with men, are disrespectful towards men, they are dirty prostitutes who deserve to be mistreated, even raped. This is at the heart of every, what were you wearing, question, or were you flirting with him, comment, were you acting in a way that gave license to male mistreatment, slut shaming and victim blaming in its purest form. In one of the most heartbreaking disclosures ever intimated in group, a woman explained that she earnestly believed her rape was a punishment from God for an affair she had on her husband. For years, this woman struggled with the conviction she deserved, even caused her rape, because she broke God's commandment not to commit adultery. We have got to kill the Madonna whore mentality in this society. First of all, <laughs> first of all, there is absolutely nothing a woman can do to deserve to be raped. Second of all, we need to recognize that women are people and not reducible to the good ones and the bad ones. This next victim blaming attitude is slightly more insidious. It does not claim that a woman is deserving of or has caused her rape, but, she was the, but that she was somehow complicit in her assault. One group member's father told her, why did you go to the dorms? I told you, women get raped in the dorms. Her father didn't say she deserved to be raped, just that she didn't do enough to prevent it. This form of victim blaming is rooted in the religious ideology that women are responsible for guarding their chastity against men. And a failure to do so is synonymous with collusion. Why were you out so late? You went with him to his car? All imply a woman's collaboration or partial responsibility in her attack. This mentality is not only extremely offensive and insensitive towards women, it is incredibly insulting to men. The idea that all men are a hair trigger away from sexually assaulting a woman, held tentatively back by societal restraints, but once given the opportunity, will pounce on a woman, is completely ridiculous and disparaging. Let <laughs> Let's not denigrate men to such a level. Let's assume men are thinking, compassionate people who desire to treat others with dignity and respect, not loathsome, degenerate creatures whose lascivious impulses must be held at bay and vigilantly guarded against. Furthermore, women are not responsible for guarding against rape. Men are responsible for not raping women. It's really simple. I can be naked, passed out on the floor, and you could not have sex with me. <laughs> <laughs> to believe anything else is victim blaming and an insult to both genders. Within the same vein, there is a hierarchy of sympathy within sexual assault based on a victim's actions during the assault. People want to know, did you fight back? Were you held at gunpoint? Did he have a knife? Signs of physical abuse, scratches, bruises, black eyes, broken bones, all shoot you up the totem pole of sympathy. This too is a victim blaming mentality because it suggests women are more or less complicit in their, in their assault, they didn't try hard enough to prevent it, or that some rape is more severe than others. Rape is rape. No one is more or less complicit in their assault because they fought their attacker or were paralyzed with fear. First of all, it is a completely natural response to be frozen with fear. And second of all, a martial arts master can be assaulted, the same as someone who has never taken a self-defense class in their lives. All rape is brutal, demoralizing, and life-altering. It all results in the utter, utter deconstruction of one's self-esteem, whether you were raped by a stranger or your boyfriend, in your home or in a taxi cab, 
whether it was drug facilitated or not. There is no better or worse way to be raped. It is all shitty as hell. Let's stop judging people based on the details of their assaults. It's crass and bloodless. The next two attitudes I'm going to talk to you about are less victim blaming in nature and more generally unsupportive attitudes and beliefs. Your religious figurehead is not a mental health professional. A victim of sexual assault is not <coughs> failing in their faith by seeking the help of a counselor or psychiatrist. The number of women I've met over a six year period who were judged by friends and family or worse, judged themselves for having to see a counselor or take medication is heartbreaking. One group member's mother told her she wouldn't need her PTSD medication if she prayed more. Or offered to schedule an, appoint an appointment with their pastor if she needed someone to talk to. This woman is trying to finish an undergraduate degree and apply to graduate programs while grappling with anxiety attacks, insomnia, and a general lack of focus. On top of that, she also now has to deal with feelings of spiritual inadequacy because her mother felt like praying would fix her PTSD. Seeking help after you have been sexually assaulted is hard enough. The tendency to want to sweep everything under the rug, pretend that nothing happened, and proceed with life as normal is strong enough without receiving external judgment on top of it. Please do not condemn someone who is brave enough to seek the help they need. Last but certainly not least, you do not have to forgive your rapist. <laughs> this maxim is particularly difficult to combat amongst Christians because there is a strong biblical basis for a belief in forgiveness. The Christian Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have verses on the need to forgive. Women agonize over this. They torture themselves trying to forgive the person who humiliated and terrorized them. Or worse yet, they stifle their genuine emotions because they believe forgiveness is the magical cure to their anger and resentment. If you have ever been sexually assaulted and have forgiven your attacker, I will never tell you you are wrong for that. However, if you have been assaulted and cannot find it in your heart to forgive the person who violated, degraded, and brutalized you, I do not consider that a personal failing. Moreover, I'm here to tell you forgiveness is patently not necessary in order to emotionally heal from sexual assault. Confronting and working through your emotions is the only way to move past them, not stifling them down and calling it forgiveness. Okay, so we've killed the false dichotomy of the Madonna and the whore. We all agree it is not a woman's duty to guard her, tra her chastity. We no longer subscribe to the hierarchy of sympathy. We agree our religious figurehead is not a mental health professional, and that forgiveness is not a requirement of emotional healing. But I told you I was going to convince you why being a slut and an atheist were positive self-identifiers. So why am I a proud slut? Because I have agency and ownership over my sexuality. I enjoy sex and choose to have it with no shame or guilt. When a woman internalizes the above-mentioned slut-shaming slut beliefs, everyone loses. When people lie to themselves about their own sexual activity, unhealthy habits and behaviors develop. Women do not take the precaution of birth control to beca because to be on birth control acknowledges the fact that you are sexually active and you plan on having sex. People do not buy condoms and have them readily available, so they do not get used. People, because again, to purchase a condom is to acknowledge you are sexually active and plan to have sex. And the most unhealthy behavior of all drinking or substance abuse in order to absolve yourself of the decision to have sex. Blame it on the alcohol, right? I was so drunk last night, I don't remember what I did. Please don't misunderstand. My judgment is not on the use of alcohol. My judgment is on a society that shames women for wanting to have sex and judges them on exactly how much sex they are allowed to have, which leads to the abuse of alcohol. Nobody wants to be seen as a bad person. So in order to reconcile their desire to be, a, to, their desire to be more moral 
and their completely human desire for sex, women use alcohol as a workaround, a way of circumventing the, circumventing the system. Well, that's just tragic and incredibly dangerous. So, if I have to choose between being a drinking, dancing, flirtatious, disrespectful, oversexed whore, or the shamed, <laughs> obedient, puritanical Madonna, I choose whore. <coughs>
freaking been in that situation. Maybe not naked, passed on the floor, but yeah, like at a party and passed out, whatever. And like people put a blankie on you, and like they don't rape you, like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and again, I don't, I don't want to characterize or mischaracterize people as, as, as dull or silly or stupid or anything, but I, I think that's maybe one of these, I think that's maybe a gender myth perhaps that we've internalized in the skeptic community that men want sex to a degree that they're willing to have it with somebody that, you know, that isn't entirely consenting. And I, I don't think that is the case. I don't think men... Um, well, um, something was brought up actually yesterday, and I don't mean to start a riff, but uh, no, it was, was it Friday. Um, the Pink Atheist talked about a statistic that said that in societies where prostitution is legalized, rape uh, there's less rape. And I, I, con I would definitely concede that that is a perhaps a, a correlation, but I would strongly contend that there's any kind of causation. I mean, that's something we discuss a lot in women's group is this idea that access to sex does not prevent rape. Um, and and I'm, I'm positive like there's other amazing things about those societies that make rape statistics go down. And, and I don't know what causes people to rape other people. Like I don't pretend to know that. I don't have the science or evidence about what, what makes somebody rape another person or what. But, um, but uh, yeah, I would strongly contest that it doesn't ha it has nothing to do with access to sex. Um, married men or you know people in relationships, I mean, that, that, that what makes somebody a rapist, I don't know. But in any event, this idea of, oh, well, you know, just be safe, you know, keep, take your drink into the bathroom, those are all good ideas. I mean, the buddy system and taking drinks with you into the bathroom, those are good ideas. But if somebody is discussing rape with you and this attitude of, well, if you just set yourself in a better position, that in and of itself present, prevents rape. You know, people not raping people prevents rape. So. That would be something I would talk about, you know, more about, you know, something we could work on attitudinally within the skeptics community. I don't know if other people have any thoughts or ideas or questions along those lines. This, this talk is obviously pretty focused towards folks that have at least some sense of alignment with religion, um, and I know many of us who don't, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, I read a blog about two months ago, and this young lady had been walking through a campus, and somebody had grabbed her, and there had been two other people Like she was being grabbed in the middle of a very public area, and I live in a college town. I go out in a college town. Would you say it's an obligation? To, I do something about it because I feel obligated to. If I see somebody, yeah, it just doesn't make sense. Like that doesn't look. You're really drunk. Maybe you shouldn't be with this guy. Like you look yeah. like you're on. That, I mean, that gets tricky. I mean, I don't know the details of that situation, but I mean, I could, I could see a scenario where, say, I'm out camping with five friends, two girls, three, three men, and these are people I know, and everybody knows we're all friends. And so maybe somebody perceived that as horseplay. We're drinking and they're horseplay, and that's. Um, I, I, you know, I wasn't there, I don't know the details of that. Yeah, of course, if somebody is grabbing you, just, just the physical act of, of, of grabbing somebody and pulling them away, that's, that's actually aggravated assault. That's not even assault assault. Um, unwanted touch is, is assault. Um, it, once you escalate that to the level of, of pushing or force, that's aggravated assault. So, I mean, again, a lot of these, a lot of these events, it's just, you know, call it sexual assault or rape, but a lot of it's just ca kind of boils down to assault assault. Like, if you're grabbing my body, if you're touching my body, and no genitals are involved or whatever, you know, that's just against my will. That's assault assault. I mean, that sounds really sad. That, that, that scenario sounds tragic. I don't, I don't know the full details of it. Perhaps they thought it was, perhaps they thought they were seeing something that, you know, it, maybe they thought it was a little less terrible than it was. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> Nothing happened. She was just being assaulted, essentially. Yeah. The general principle of speaking up, though, I mean, I think is a good point to make. And, you know, the worst case scenario, if, if, we're, if we find ourselves in that scenario and say somebody spoke up or said, like, what are you guys doing? Like, get off of her. And they're like, maybe the girl herself is like, why are you being a jerk right now? Like, we're all just having fun. Okay, well, the worst thing that just happened was a, 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 a social awkward moment. Like, you look like a jerk for a minute. And I think, you know, even in conversations about, you know, sexual assault and or, or women and sexuality and stuff like that. You know, us as skeptics, atheists, or just compassionate human beings, you know, knowledgeable human beings about these issues could speak up a little bit more and say, actually, and actually, um, we were having a conversation the other night. I don't remember your name, sir. Anywho, oh. we were having a conversation actually at that bar. It was, it was kind of interesting. And he is an example of where a friend of his 
was being an ass and saying shitty stuff, and you called him out on it, you know, like stuff like that more. Do you want to give the details of that? I don't remember which one you're talking about. You were, uh, you were, <laughs> <laughs> somebody, somebody was uh, saying something, if I remember correctly, to the effect of like a, a girl was being a whore because something, identifying oh, somebody as whorish. Yes, they were, uh, I think the joke was, uh, or the story goes, uh, I was in a room and they were having a conversation and the guy called the girl a whore. I'm like, I got in his face, I'm like, hey, don't call her a whore. Whore's good for money, she just really likes it. <laughs> so I kind of got everybody in the room pissed off at me, but I, I tried to make it so I could step in and stop the conversation directed towards me because I didn't want him directing it at her at the moment. Yeah, and sadly for some people, that that's an insult. Now to me, that isn't an insult. You know, the I, I think that's funny and cute <laughs> and, and, I and poignant. Too. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Really hurtful. Not, not me personally. Okay. I'm just saying that no, this was an actual case. 
Okay. Well, no, and, that, and that, it's not to say that that doesn't happen. I mean, it just it sounds like the, that kind of stuff happens as well. And, and rape is, um, as far as evidence goes, can be extremely difficult to identify if things, you know, if drug facilitated rape is happening and people are using condoms and or if or if consensual sex is happening and then it turns into rape, that can be difficult to identify. So it's it's difficult. Um, I think my talk largely focuses more on the idea of like if somebody's you know comes to you and has been raped, you know. Uh, us as, as, as I think w wanting to be compassionate human beings, maybe we could avoid some of the questions like, well, were you walking alone at night kind of things? I mean, and then leave it up to the court system. I mean, I'm for leaving, you know, the court, the letting the court system do its, its job. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, I know there are other questions and I apologize. You've got to, I've got to get, uh, stick to it.